black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Sure. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Going to be welcoming back to the show William Sheehan, who wrote uh, Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters, Volumes 1 through 4, uh, William Sheehan. So if you go to Amazon, look up William J. Sheehan. Uh, he actually wrote the bill, uh, wrote the books, and I love the books. I sit and I read them every night, then I fall asleep and I uh, <laughs> have nightmares. Uh, bill, welcome back to the show. How are you doing tonight? Very good, Wes. Very good. And yourself? Oh, thanks for asking, Bill. I, I'm doing pretty well, my friend. I'm doing pretty well. Thank you so much for taking the time to come back on the show. I really do appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure, and uh, thank you to the listeners for the uh, outpouring of support. Uh, I see a lot of people are purchasing the books and the e-books, and uh, it does my heart good to see people uh, embracing you know, something that I put together. Yeah, I'm glad that they're uh, buying the books, and re- I enjoy reading them, and I'm really not a reader, but I, I definitely enjoy reading them. I know the first encounter we're going to talk about tonight is from Volume 1, uh, The Pheasant Hunter. If you would, tell us about that, Bill. Okay, so uh, this account was told to me by a fellow named Eddie Pettigrew. Uh, it's an amazing story. Let's begin. Some of the good old boys and I had planned a weekend pheasant hunt. If we all showed up, there would be 12 of us there, a group perfectly suited to flush the soybean field that we had in mind for the hunt. It was about 10 a.m. on Saturday by the time all of these old timers had arrived. I was the captain of the hunt and my job was to call out when I wanted the two end men to begin the flush through the field. When everything works well, the line of hump hunters form a crescent moving forward through the field, which gives the end men a shot at anything flying away. Most of the guys were shooting eight shot through a modified choke, including myself. This shot size and choke would put a good spread of pellets on any bird at 20 to 25 yards. And since the pheasant is typically a low flyer, you won't have much more distance to shoot without endangering those who are flanking you on the drive. The rule is that we never turn more than the 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock position with our bodies or our guns. That day we took about 13 birds, which was a fairly good day's work for the crew. The next day, we were supposed to hit a nearby cornfield for more of the same, but the weather wasn't cooperating, the forecast being for rain showers all day long. I got on the phone with my buddy Mike and asked him if he was willing to give it a go, even though all of the other guys on the phone chain had bailed. I told Mike that I really liked the look of the thicket next to the soybean field that we had hunted yesterday and I suggested bringing the dog with us. Mike was usually game for anything, and today was no exception. I put my setter in the truck and met up with him at the field. 
it was dreary and drizzling when we got there. Now, just so you understand, there was a thicket flanking this field on two sides, made up of a very deep and intertwined bramble. There was no, may, uh, no way a man in his right mind would penetrate it or even attempt to do so, for you would be torn up before you knew what hit you. However, a dog could sneak around low, going in and out of the little tunnels that were formed by the growth, and flush out a bird. The morning didn't work out so well, even though this appeared to be choice ground. I don't know if it was the rain or the fact that the temperature had dropped 10 degrees, but the dog hadn't spooked a single bird. I thought that maybe he couldn't get where they were hunkered down since a bird won't jump until it's forced to. You almost have to step on them before they will take to the air. Having no success in the morning, we took a little break with our plan being to hit the other side of the field later on once the rain let up. So we took the dog and walked about a half mile over to the other thicket. This one was even denser than the other had been, and I began to wonder if the dog could even work it at all. We began to work southward as the dog moved through the mess, and after about 20 minutes, the dog was so deep inside that we couldn't see or hear him, so I called him out. We pet him and gave him a snack, before sending him back in. It must have been only a few minutes before we heard him yelp and start to bark frantically. We thought that perhaps he had found a bobcat because that was the only other time I had heard him sound like this. For today's hunt, I had switched my ammo to a seven and a half shot, knowing that the seven and a half shot would give me a range of about 30 to 35 yards, which is better than the eight shot. The pellets are slightly larger and heavier, which also gives them more flight time to the target. The dog was barking frantically in the thicket, and he didn't respond to my call at all. He had obviously seen something that we could not. When all of a sudden, a monstrous Bigfoot erupted from the thicket, and we both knew immediately what it was. I turned my over and under double towards it, and hit it squarely with both loads at very close range. I'm not bragging, but I am a very proficient shot, and I nailed this critter broadside with both barrels, and it didn't even flinch. Now, if a human had tried to run through this patch, it would be like trying to pull free from a pair of razor blade handcuffs. But this thing was bowling through the crap like he was running through a wheat field. He took one quick glance at us and tore out. I don't know what they are made of, but if you or I attempted to do what it did, you couldn't. It would take you 10 minutes to go 10 feet, and you would be so cut up, we would have to call an ambulance. It was tearing through this mess at full giddy-up, like a weed whacker on steroids. My partner quickly squeezed off two more rounds, but by that time, it wasn't worth the effort. If my to two loads didn't take him down at 20 yards, nothing would. In about 30 seconds, he was gone. We tried to hustle down the thicket. Mike had three more chambered, and I was trying to reload, but it was all to no avail. This booger was gone, and we were shocked that we couldn't even see him running away. Talk about excitement. We had gone from zero to hero and back in about 45 seconds. My heart was racing a mile a minute, and I know Mike felt the same way. We both kept saying to each other that we couldn't believe it, but believe it we did. We had just witnessed and shot at a giant booger in the soy soybean fields thicket. This sucker had to be nine feet tall easily. I say this because no matter where you stood by the side of this thicket, it was a foot taller than me, and this critter was head and shoulders above the top. He was kind of grayish white, and his fur was longer than I thought it would be, even though I had heard all the stories beforehand. The upper body looked like two 50-gallon drums welded together. 
Sometime after all of this, I couldn't stop thinking about the shotgun blast that had showed no effect on the creature. This thing's outer skin must be as thick as a board. I hit him squarely with close to 1,200 pellets at 50 to 60 feet, and I didn't notice so much as a clump of fur come flying off. There was nothing. It was like I had fired two blanks at it. I got to thinking that maybe its skin was like an elephant's, or maybe its hair follicles reach a couple of inches deep or something. A shotgun wouldn't take an elephant down, and it wouldn't take down this booger either. When we got back to town, we told all the boys what we had seen, and they were beside themselves. You don't want to run into one of these bad boys with anything less than a 30 odd six, and that's the truth of the whole matter. So that was pretty, uh, <laughs> I can't imagine. Uh, I'm a shooter. Uh, I, I don't hunt per se. I shoot trap and skeet. But uh, my over and under Beretta, if you got hit with that thing at the range this guy was talking about with that pellet load, you're not walking away. <laughs> no, you're I not. Mean, yeah. Just incredible, you know? It is incredible. It makes you wonder, because I've heard encounters like this before, Bill, where uh, people take a shot, and it makes you wonder, I mean, it just must be so dense. You know, you hit a grown man at birdshot like that. Shotgun, you hit a man close enough, you can cut a guy in half with a shotgun, even with, yeah. you know. And so I think, um, yeah, that's fascinating. That's really fascinating. You can tell he's from the south, too, because he calls it boogers. You can tell he probably ran across them before. Uh, I've noticed that before in the past when I talk to people from the South, when they start really talking about boogers, uh, you can tell they've either run into one or they know someone that has. And for yeah, him to turn and shoot, he must have really felt like he was in fear. He had a lot of uh, secondhand uh, experience having heard of uh, the Bigfoot, the booger. Uh, but he was kind of standoffish about it, having never seen one for himself. And apparently there's a lot of uh, moonshine chatter, you know, when people have had a snootful talking about this and that. And he kind of thought that's all it was. And yet on this particular day, if he hadn't had his setter with him, uh, who was in deep in this thicket, obviously annoying the heck out of this Bigfoot that was buried in there, they would have never known that thing was in the thicket. Yeah. It was only because of the relentless uh, hounding of the dog, the barking and everything, that the creature had launched out of the thicket and decided to make a beeline for wherever it was going. I mean, you know, and his saying that, uh, I, I like the way he put it, and that's why I was inclusive of it, uh, razor blade handcuffs. <laughs> I said to myself, well, that about uh, sizes up uh, what would happen to you if you were t trying to go running through this bramble yourself. It just was uh, beyond the pale as far as impossibility for a human to go through there. And yet the creature was able to go busting through there like it was nothing and virtually unharmed by the shot or the briar patch itself. Just incredible. It really is. And like I said, I've had a lot of, um, I've talked to a lot of encounters where people shot at them and hunters are kind of, they're not really sure what to think because you, you know how many hunters I've talked to where they've pulled the trigger and it seems like it doesn't affect them. Um, fascinating, fascinating stuff. That's a Pheasant Hunters Volume 1. Let's go to the uh, Bone Pile Volume 4. I'm really curious about this. Um, I had my own bone pile story a couple episodes back. But if you would, Bill, tell us about the bone pile. This is uh, volume yeah, no. four, Bigfoot Tear in the Woods. Sorry, Bill, Bill I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 no. It's interesting that you said you had a story because I actually have two accounts from a bone pile. This is the second one. And the interesting thing about this is – the bone pile in and of itself is enough to get you thinking. But the fellow who was hunting 
is the real point of interest in this story, as you will uh, soon see. And I'm going to I'm going to read it just the way I wrote it. And in there, you'll see that I make reference uh, to the previous story of the bone pile. Perfect. Although I, as a writer, under most circumstances, do not consider repetition to be advisable. When we are speaking of all things Bigfoot, repetition seems to be the norm as far as they and their habits are concerned. I am continually presented with the same or similar circumstances surrounding the sightings of and or the evidential findings relative to these creatures. In one of my previous witness testimonies, there was a collection of bones found in the deep woods while he was on the hunt. As you will soon read, yet another collection of bones has been found with somewhat of a gruesome twist as to whom or what they belong to. I would also be remiss if I didn't tell you that of all the people who could run across such a finding, David Brinks has spent the past 17 years as an orthopedic surgeon. I will step aside now and allow David Brinks to testify as to what exactly he found in the Kootenay by Mount Oki on October 7th, 1999. As I told you, Bill, when we first made contact, I did not personally see anything in regards to a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch type creature. But it was rather what I found while on the hunt that troubled me to such an extent that to this very day, I am haunted by it in my thoughts. I also told you, I have given up hunting in the deep woods entirely October 7th, 1999, was my last day in the forest. I have likewise sold off my entire collection of long rifles, which had been quite extensive and expensive as a result of what I encountered that day. I had hiked in about six miles following Tokum Creek, to where I had reached a point where I was in, shall I say, the shadow of Mount Oki. While hiking in this entire area, it is full of life of a variety of sorts. Animals, both large and small, abound, as well as birds and critters of every sort imaginable, providing one is looking. I was, as I said, about six miles in, when the realization came upon me that everything had grown eerily still and silent. This happened so gradually that it must have been over the course of perhaps a mile before I actually stood still in one spot to look and listen in order to confirm my thoughts and my feelings. When the realization had struck me and my hunch had been confirmed, in reference to the stillness and lifelessness I was encountering. A cold chill went through my body like a lightning bolt from head to toe. I had never experienced a feeling as such in my entire life of hunting. This was followed by a feeling of imminent danger and the thought that I may even lose my life. Personally, I have over 10 years of education and I'm not used to psychological breakdowns of any sort taking hold of me. My career and my patients being completely reliant on my ability to be level-headed and skilled at both what I do and who I am. I remember standing my ground and trying to gain control of my thoughts for some 20 minutes because after all, I couldn't exactly run out of here with my gear. At some point, I felt as though I had somewhat normalized again and began to move into the timber by the base of Mount Oki, following what appeared to be a rather broad game trail, which from the looks of it seemed to be well-traveled by large animals in the area. I came upon what I will describe as a small side path, 
which was leading through a wall of brush that was about 10 feet tall. Walking through this wall of brush, this small trail opened up into what looked like a cleared campsite. In other words, the ground in here was virtually cleared of debris and was so tamped down that it looked like hard pack. It measured some 30 feet by 15 feet, being oblong in its dimensions. Scattered about in this clearing at first glance were hundreds upon hundreds of animal bones strewn randomly about in the clearing. As my mind was trying to process that which my eyes were now seeing, my vision shifted to what appeared to be a camouflage jacket laying off to the left side near the fringe of the clearing. I stepped over to take a closer look when I realized that the jacket was still wrapped around who had been its owner. The waistline of the coat was collapsed to the ground, and when I lifted it up with a stick, the remains of a human pelvis were visible, devoid of the lower extremities. Upon probing the upper torso with the branch, the coat was still supported by what I assumed was the still intact rib cage as well as the skeletal hands and arms extending from what were now severely deteriorated sleeves. As I now examined what was a severely damaged skull, my observations confirmed that the entirety of the facial structure from the maxilla to the frontal bone, inclusive of the nasal, zygomatic, temporal, orbital, and the lesser bones had all been impacted by some type of blunt force trauma, which had rendered the entire face compressed to some five inches within the skull. I knew immediately that this had not been done by a bear, and no human was capable of delivering such a blow. The head looked as though a seven inch round block of steel had been pounded into it front on. I started to tremble and shake quite violently as I stood looking over this apparent victim of some type of hideous murder. But why this individual had found his place here with all of these other bones was incomprehensible to my rational way of thinking. Within the confines of this space, there were no bones visible that still had flesh or tissue attached to them in any state of decomposition. And yet, here I was standing in the middle of animal and human remains on a patch of ground that was so worn and hardened that not so much as a weed was coming forth out of it. With my gloves on, I attempted to do a search of the remaining pocket areas of the coat and came up with a business card for an insurance agency about 200 miles away from where I now was. Having made my way out of the woods and back to civilization, I immediately reported my findings and the location to the local authorities. I gave them the business card and offered to take them back where I had made the find if they desired me to do so, to which they responded that they would let me know if they needed any further assistance on my part. To this day, I am tormented by having found this torso with no legs lying in this sea, sea of bones within the forest. Something or someone had spent a lot of time in that clearing to have worn it down to the state in which I had found it. It had the appearance of a campsite that was used on a regular basis by a family of five, and yet nothing was there when I had arrived. Out of everything that I had seen and felt, it was the damage that had been rendered to the indiv individual's face that haunts me to this very day. Death from such an impact was certainly instantaneous, and yet 
what had performed such an evil act was unknown. I had contacted you, Bill, because my own thought process had brought me around to the notion that this was done by a Sasquatch. I have never heard of or known a bear to deliver such a blow, and the remains of the jacket showed no signs of having been slashed or clawed in any way, other than the natural breakdown of the fabric having been left outside in the elements for a prolonged period of time. What do you make of that? It's tragic. This is what I make of that. It's tragic. It's interesting. I had, um, and for the audience, that's a bone pile, uh, volume four, Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters, uh, Bill Sheehan. But, you know, Bill, that that reminds me of, uh, I think it was episode 468 I had on uh, Rick from Canada. He had discovered a bone pile almost identical to what you described. As that guy was telling you his encounter, almost word for word, that's what he said. He walked in. It was this big tunnel system, and it opened up to this big, wide, round area where it looked like a bunch of giants were in there eating animals. Uh, And he made the comment, well, I didn't see any humans, so otherwise I would report it to the police. But in reality, I know he didn't spend time looking around. He knows he didn't spend time looking around. I wouldn't, you know, I would get out of there as quick. You know, I come across something like that. I'm out of there. Um, It's tragic. You know, you hear people disappearing. They just vanish. And you always wonder what happens to them. And and I think this goes on more than people want to admit. Well, it's funny that you mention that because I, uh, the thing that came to my mind, I, I had listened to, I don't have his books or book. I had listened to uh, David Polites on uh, Coast to Coast AM on a few occasions. And I heard his accounts of missing people. And although he wasn't forthcoming with the how or the why, he was just stating the disappearances and the events surrounding them. And I said to myself, I have witness accounts, numerous witness accounts, of bodies being found with the rib cage caved in, limbs missing uh, by hunters and hikers. And I said to myself, these have to be some of these people that go missing. You know, you don't, you're not just walking along with somebody in a group and you suddenly disappear. I mean, even if a mountain lion got the jump on you and grabbed your jugular to the point where you couldn't speak, uh, you know, a 150-pound cougar is not going to be able to just drag away a man in a matter of seconds to the point where nobody can see or hear what happened. It's just, it's it's an impossibility to me. Yeah, I agree. And and there's going to be a mess. You know, if a cougar gets a jump on you, it's going to be it's going to be a bloody fight to the end. Um, but and it's going to be a mess. So you can usually tell when a cougar gets someone. Um, and this is just something very different. This isn't a bear. This isn't a serial killer. This isn't a cougar. Um, the way he describes that. God, it's such a terrible story. The way he describes that dead person. It's something very different. It's not natural, in my opinion. Well, what? First of all, if you think about the cause of death being a frontal blow, as the doctor described it, and then he describes it as a round cylinder of steel having been rammed through the front of the face, and he gives the details of all of the individual facial bones that were rammed five inches deep into the skull. And the surrounding skull was still intact. It was something that was pounded. Picture taking a sledgehammer, which is, what, two and a half inches in diameter? Yeah. And just bashing it into a pumpkin. And the hole that it makes and all of the rind and everything gets driven into the pumpkin. And the rest of the pumpkin is still intact around it. This is the way he's describing this head. The, the impact had to have, ha- have occurred so suddenly and forcefully that it was able to just bang 
through the middle of the face, withdraw the hand, and the rest of the head was intact, like a, 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 a King Kong jab, if you will. Bam! And you're dead. I mean, that is just... And he said, he's a hunter. He had a collection of long rifles. Uh, and you can only imagine uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon, his collection was probably insane, and he sold them all off. I'm not going to go back him. in the woods again. That's yeah. what he said. Can't blame him. I don't think I would either, especially after that. You don't even need to see a Sasquatch in that situation. You can realize what what done, what done, did that damage. You know, it's interesting. There's an account from Canada of a hunter coming across a uh, a dead grizzly bear. And the way he describes the injuries are very similar to this. He said it looked like something very large punched it in the face, caved in the whole side of its face, like it just hit it like a right hook from a boxer. I guess the only positive side to the story, I'm I'm sure it was a quick death. I'm sure he it was quick and it was over very quickly. He probably didn't even see it coming. Well, if he did, uh, the... Uh... The terror as he was grabbed before being punched or whatever, you know, may almost shock you to death. But then, boom, uh, as the doctor said, you know, this is incredible. And, you know, Wes, I had I had a couple of thoughts in mind that I'd like to share with you and the listeners. You know, it's been said or it is said. And this is relative to the way people perceive Sasquatch and some of the shows where the dudes are marching around looking for them with flashlights and infrared. But as a writer, you know, my wheels are always turning. And I said to myself, I want to share this with Wes and the listeners. You know, it's been said that there is a time coming when the lion will lay down with the lamb. But that time is not now. Right now, the lion eats the lamb and enjoys doing it. And if the listeners out there or anybody else is thinking for one minute that you are going to go cozy up with the hairy man, think again. It's my opinion that this thing will tear your sorry carcass up limb from limb and you will end up looking like a hard-boiled egg that got dropped into a blender. Personally, I wouldn't enter into the woods with anything less than, say, a Remington pump stuffed with double odd buckshot and a holstered 45 as backup. You were talking before about other guys who have shot at Bigfoot, and we just heard about uh, Eddie Pettigrew pumping two rounds of seven and a half load at this guy at close range. I have a witness in book six. Uh, the story is uh, entitled The Fifth Bullet. This guy pumped four rounds. Now, of course, I won't tell you the full story because one might say, well, maybe he shot over him or around him. I can tell you he didn't. He pumped four rounds downrange at a Sasquatch that was charging his position from an M1 carbine, and this sucker kept coming. I mean, just think about that. I mean, I am a good shot. I could shoot a bottle cap off a pop bottle at 50 feet. If I aim at you running at me across a football field, you are going down. And I was listening to him under the premise that he was a good shot. And I thought he had to be a good shot because not too many guys will just go out hunting without a scope. He had a, a, a bare bones M1 carbine, Korean Korean War uh, vintage, and he put four rounds on this sucker that was coming at him, and it didn't go down. That yeah, is that's scary. Absolutely nuts. It is nuts. You know, it's like the when I had the uh, the people on for the, uh, was it Spotsville Monster? Um, they got up on their roof, and every one of them had a rifle. If you can imagine a bunch of hillbillies up on a roof, and there are all, and I say hillbillies in a, in a loving term, but they're all armed to the teeth. They're the people I'd want if I had Sasquatch around. But anyway, they're all up on the, <laughs> they're all up on the roof, and this thing comes out of the barn, and they all blast it. 
and it just keeps going. I mean, it jumps the fence and leaves. And he, I had the mother on, and she was like, I don't know what to say. That I'm sure they hit it. They hit it, must have hit it several times. And you're right. That is terrifying, man. When you start, you pull that. That's why I think one needs to be shot, but you need to be very careful shooting one. And it's not just that one. What about his his buddy or his brother or whatever? Um, you got to be careful in those situations, and, and they don't just go down so quickly. Makes you really wonder about the build of them and the muscle structure, because it takes a lot to withstand something like that and not go down. I thought that Eddie Pettigrew uh, had hit on a very unique point, which was his idea of making uh, uh, the relationship between an elephant and a Sasquatch. You know, a gun was created that was then aptly named the elephant gun, because this is what hunters were taking to Africa to take down an elephant, apparently having failed with other weapons they had brought previously. I mean, I wasn't there, but if you now name something the elephant gun, it had to be a creation for a hunter shooting elephants. Right. It had to be a hell and of a what, gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's got to be a big bore with a large projectile and uh, a lot of powder in the shell. You know, I remember as a kid, uh, my father showing me a piece of forty five cal uh fifty caliber ammunition. And when I held it in my hand, and I'm not saying an elephant gun shoots fifty caliber ammo, but when I held that bullet in my hand and I thought of uh a machine gun chattering away, sending these projectiles down range, I thought to myself, Holy God uh, you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that reign of terror because it would have just been unmerciful, you know, blowing cinder blocks out of buildings, shooting, you know, this 50 caliber ab uh, ammo could go through a metal door, blow through a cinder block wall, kill you on the other side of a wall. And yet this, this other fellow in book six, uh, the fifth bullet, four rounds into the monster and it was running. I mean, that is just like crazy. Now we both know when you go to hunt animals, if you don't get a heart shot, even if you hit them in the lung, uh, you may see some spray through the scope and still have to chase them a fair distance to find them. But four rounds uh, in the chest, I have to say that really the only way you could seriously take one of these things down would probably be a, 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 a perfect shot to the head, the eye, the neck, uh, because these guys are shooting them in the chest. Uh, uh, the fellow was aiming for the, the meat of the target, you know, and he put four rounds in him and nothing. So <laughs> I, yeah. I, I really don't know what to say about that. You know, it's just no, I'm like, with what? I'm with you. I'm with you. When when is five and six coming out? I had a couple members ask me uh, when volumes five and six of Bigfoot Terror in the Woods sightings and encounters. When is that coming out, Bill? Well, uh, five, I believe, will probably be out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, in fact, my proofer just emailed me today and said uh, she thought she'd be done with it tonight. Uh, but then there's other incidentals involved with it and then getting it together with the uh, cover art and then uploading it to uh, uh, Amazon. So uh, it'll be, I, I think within about two weeks, five should be up. And six is probably going to come out, uh, I'd say maybe late in October. Well, I can't wait, Bill. I can't wait for five and six to come out. I'm on volume three. Uh, but for the audience out there, go to Amazon, check it out. Bigfoot, Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters, volume one through four. Uh, William Sheehan, Bill Sheehan. If you get a chance, pick up his book. I'll throw a link in the description. I almost feel like you need a break after that Boneyard story, man. 
Um, join now. Let's go to a, a live read. <laughs> Just take a break from that boneyard story. Uh, join now. My bookie will match your deposit dollar for dollar. And my bookie is actually sponsoring this show. That's why there's additional shows. So join now. And my bookie will match your deposit dollar for dollar. Use promo code Chronicles to activate the offer. Visit my bookie online today. That's my bookie. And don't forget to use the promo code Chronicles. Uh, when creating your account to claim the bonus so you can get that they match your dollar for dollar uh, you play you win you get paid and i'll talk more about it this weekend i haven't had my bets placed or anything uh, but my bookie's been pretty good to my uh pocketbook with my bets and they're kind enough to sponsor this additional show so thank you to uh my bookie bill let's talk about the rutland encounter now this is in uh volume one and the book again is bigfoot terror in the woods sightings and encounters Tell us about this. This is really interesting because it involved a duo, two people. Both of these uh, people had been in this very same location before. It was one of their favorite fishing holes. Uh, So let me get down to brass tacks here and read you the account. This account came to me by way of Danny Sheehan, who is unrelated to me. In retirement, My Uncle Jack moved to Rutland County in Vermont, having been employed as a graphic artist for most of his life. He had also dabbled in watercolor painting as a hobby for an equally long period of time. Being a city boy for most of his life, he would head up to the country whenever possible in search of some interesting subject matter to paint with his favorite themes being fly fishermen, covered bridges, old farmhouses, and boats. He not only painted fly fishermen, but was totally taken to the sport himself. I would go to visit him periodically in order to fly fish with him, and within the immediate surroundings of his area alone, there were many great places to fish for brook trout. It was a veritable potpourri of fly fishing pleasure. On this day, we headed to a place where we had fished several times in the past, it being my uncle's favorite spot to fish, and with good reason. Not only was the fishing superb, but this location was some of the most beautiful Vermont property that you will ever set your eyes on. While I fished on the rocky bank of this creek several years before, My uncle had been on the other side of the creek with an easel using me as a model for a painting, and I have this painting in my home to this very day. We were near a town called Wallingford and were fishing a body of water known as Otter Creek. He knew a gentleman who owned an old farmstead that this creek passed through, and it was the combination of the man's property and outbuildings in conjunction conjunction with the shape and natural design of the creek in this area, which made it such an outstanding location. I will do my best to bring you into this picture. The original owners of the farm had been cheesemakers and created what we now know as Vermont cheddar. I would say that the acreage was about 40, give or take a few, and there was a large farmhouse that sat in the middle of the land as well as two very large unpainted and well-weathered barns. When you looked out over the farm from the elevation of the house, it was mostly cleared, rolling, terraced land, aside from a few trees that had been left for shade and aesthetics. It was comprised of a number of large sections, which were separated from each other with split rail fences and gates, which had allowed the cows to graze in certain areas while allowing the rest to grow back. This terraced land rolled down to the edge of the creek where we were standing, with the creek itself being maybe 40 feet wide at this point, including its rock-strewn banks. Now, if you were to stand on the western side of the creek, your back would be to the farm, and if you crossed over to the eastern side, your back was now against a steep embankment that had trees of many shapes and sizes growing on it. The creek had grayish colored sharply angled stones on both of its banks as well as within it. 
some weighed hundreds of pounds, and most of the larger stones which within the river had fish hiding behind them. For the most part, the creek was about a foot deep, but there were also some smaller, deeper pools. The day was very overcast and gray, which I prefer over bright sunlight for fishing, so for me, it was perfect. There was not another soul in, height, uh, in sight, and as we had permission to be here by the owner, and he was away on a Christian mercy mission in South America, being a doctor by trade, he and a medical team occasionally donated their skills and time to help others who are less fortunate than the rest of us. And so we were alone and tucked down into this creek. For those of you who don't fish, there are times when fishermen laugh and joke around, but most of the time is spent in silence and solitude. We had been quietly working the creek for two to three hours when we heard a large splash on the water that came from somewhere around the bend. I saw my uncle look in the direction of the splash, but we kept on fishing. Moments later, we heard a couple more splashes in quick succession as we quietly began to move towards the sounds. Exchanging a couple of quiet words and wondering what have, might have made the noise. A splash always gets the utmost attention from a fisherman. It doesn't matter if you are in the bay, ocean, lake, river, or creek. A fisherman always wants to know what's splashing and why. So the two of us began to stealthily creep along the bank. We were both hunched over trying to catch a first glimpse under some tree branches. All of a sudden, I saw a long, dark arm reach down and hit the water with a splash, and my uncle wheeled backwards and almost fell. He turned and mouthed to me, it's a damn Bigfoot, and waved for me to move back. We must have retreated about a hundred yards away, moving to a point far beyond where we had begun, and for additional protection, we had crossed to the other side of the creek and climbed up the farm's first grassy berm to a point where we were about 15 feet or so above the creek. Slowly, we started to make our way to a place where we could see the creature, doing our utmost to use some bushes and small trees as cover. Finally, we reached a favorable position and hunkered down to observe its movements. We were further away, but we could see even more now than we had seen from the creek. This Bigfoot must have been so preoccupied with trying to grab a trout that it didn't stand a chance of noticing us. He was bent over, staring at the water, without so much as taking a single break to look away. We watched him try to grab a trout at least 20 times without success, but he just kept trying. This thing was determined. Now, just in case you don't know, trout are extremely slimy, and this slime acts as a protective coating. It's generally only, only after a good fight that you're able to cradle them very gently in your hand and take the hook out of their mouth. No matter who or what you are, the act of grabbing one while it was swimming is nearly impossible, hence the creature's obvious frustration. We must have watched for 45 minutes, and still it hadn't had any success in catching a trout. Finally, it looked up, surveyed the area briefly, and turned, climbing up the steep bank in three steps, and having reached the top, it walked away out of our sight. The bank that it had climbed must have been about 15 feet tall and was on a very steep angle. When the monster had been standing next to this embankment, it had been well over half the height of this slope, and it took three strides up this steep embankment without using any hand grabs before it was gone over the top and out of our sight. It was absolutely out of this world. It was only once the thing was out of our sight that we began to talk quietly. 
When I had initially seen the arm come into view, I thought that it had to be five feet long. It turns out that my uncle had seen the head and upper body at the same time that I had seen the extended arm. So he knew what the thing was way before I did. Its hair had some rusty colored undertones to it. And I think that if the sun was shining, we would have been able to see even more reddish hues. The hair was actually very long. And on some areas of the body, in particular the head, I would say that it was 10 inches or so in length. And it hung off the back of its arms as well. The head was somewhat conical, but not pointy. And the upper part of the skull stood out much prouder than ours. Its face was much flattened and the jaw protruded well beyond its nose. Its facial skin was also very dark and deeply furrowed. In fact, the wrinkles were so deep that they appeared as painted black lines on the face and brow of the creature. I would estimate its weight at about 1,500 pounds. This beast's back was five times as thick as those of the most massive weightlifters that you have ever seen in your life. I would venture to say that it could probably snap a baseball bat in half with just its fingers. When we had briefly caught a back view of the creature, it appeared to me that its triceps were maybe 12 inches wide, and perhaps even more than that. Now try standing in front of a mirror while holding a ruler next to your arm and visualize what I am saying. When we saw it take the three steps up the embankment, its legs were obviously flexed to the maximum with the thigh muscles having bulged to the point where they looked to be two feet thick. The body strength that would be needed to make this motion so quickly and without grabbing so much as a branch would be off the charts in the human realm. But This thing is in no way a human being, nor is it our mutated offspring. This is some kind of animal. I remember seeing a film clip of a grizzly bear running down a deer on a mountain slope. This grizzly was booking it, and its musculature was all business. When I watch a deer get spooked, and run on my own property, it's incomprehensible that anything else could yet, could catch it. And yet, this 1,500-pound grizzly had the wherewithal to do so. It was so real, and yet so unreal at the same time. And he's speaking to me. I know you get it, but when you are there, seeing it with your own two eyes, it is only then that the legends can ring true and become part of your own reality. That is incredible. That is incredible. And you know that we were talking about the the pheasant hunters, and you hear this guy described in the Rutland encounter in in Volume 1. You can kind of see where, you know, you you pop off a shotgun, you're probably not going to take it down, you know, especially the way he's described. Imagine hitting that with a shotgun. Um, It's just not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. It's not going down. If he doesn't run and he decides to come at you because now he's pissed off, you're toast. Yeah, I agree. There's no no defense. And it's fascinating, too, his behavior that you described there, Bill. Um, I had uh, the albino white sask or albino monkey. I don't remember what I named it. White monkey, albino monkey of Pennsylvania. It was a member-only show, and and he described something very similar, where the thing was grabbing fish, trying to grab fish, and this one had actually grabbed fish out of the river and was eating it, and after it got done, it would just toss it over its shoulder, grab another one, and try and eat it. So that's that's fascinating. You remember earlier I had uh, I had mentioned that to me these creatures live their lives like. Uh, the special forces teaches survival training. You are down 
you are separated from everything you know and love. And now everything takes over as far as I need to get food, I need to get shelter, I need to get water. And you will try and do anything and everything you can in any area that you are in to get that. Whether it's taking a shot at drinking some creek water, hoping you don't get sick, breaking into somebody's chicken coop and uh, snapping the neck of a bird and hoping you could roast it over some type of fire you'll be able to make. Maybe uh, try to create a spear and, and, and get yourself a trout. These creatures, they're in the coops. They're taking people's animals. They're in the orchards. They're in the farm fields. They're in the streams trying to get fish. Uh, I told you of an account that's in one of the books to come of Sasquatch seen grabbing the remains that the bears had finished with on a salmon river. Uh, and as a matter of fact, this very creek, Otter Creek, I have another account on the same river. Now, by the way, this is the longest uh, running body of water in Vermont, so it covers an extensive amount of uh, real estate. But two separate encounters uh, of a Sasquatch being by this same body of water, which tells me they are frequenting this area as a feeding ground. I don't know if they're using it as a trail, walking along the side of it to get to other locations. Who knows? We don't know. But it's really interesting. And as I stated in the beginning, repetition when it comes to Sasquatch is the norm. People are witnessing similar or the same things here tonight. You and I, I have two bone pile uh, accounts in my own possession. And I think you just said you had one in Canada and another one from another individual, no? Yeah, it's pretty amazing, really. And you're right, yeah. there is a lot of similarities you can draw between encounters. It, it's um, It's disturbing is what it is, you know, it, yeah. like the bone pile, you know, when you were telling that encounter, it's like, God, I, I just had a guy on, I named the show Devil's Lettuce because he was out there planting marijuana, <laughs> which I got no problem with, you know, I could care less if he's out there planting weed, good for him. Um, but yeah, it, it reads very similar to what this guy, this doctor was talking about. And you see that from encounter to encounter. That's why until we have a body, you're not going to learn anything about these creatures. I hate to break it to everyone. There's no Bigfoot experts, and most of these Bigfoot researchers are full of BS. Most of them have no clue what they're talking about, and I, it's just the way it is. Um, and I hate to say it, but it's just the way it is. The best information you can get is from an eyewitness because you start to draw parallels, just like the bone pile, just like you know uh, we talked about shooting one. There's a lot of parallels. Right. And you know it's the same in medicine, Wes. How do they uh, achieve treatment protocols and uh, find out what works and what doesn't work? Through the patient's experiences. Things are refined and, and hopefully bettered uh, for future people, patients, and generations by what others have experienced in the past. This is why they call it practicing medicine. It's not a definitive uh, form. Yeah. It is ever morphing and ever changing as you move forward. Uh, I wish I had, I don't mind sharing with your audience, and by the way, if you're a man in this listening audience, you need to have your PSA blood test on, on a regular basis. I, Wes, I went for a blood test for an insurance policy. And uh, I have medical training. When I got the results back, I saw the results. And when I read them, I went, oh, my God. My PSA was skyrocketed. And a high PSA level in a man indicates the potential uh, that there is cancer present. Well, one thing led to another. And I had prostate cancer. And at the time, I went for 43 
external beam radiation treatments, and I'm 10 years clear now, thank God. But since then, there are other treatments out now, uh, like CyberKnife and some other things that are better than what I had. Uh, but I was thankful I had what I had at the time because I'm alive to talk to you. Yeah, I am too. I'm glad you brought that up. I might have to go have a blood test done. I didn't realize you could even test for cancer through a blood test. That's fascinating. Well, um, it's the PSA. It's the PSA, which is the prostate stimulating antigen. And when those levels get high in a man, it's time to, uh, you know, see your urologist and make sure you're, you're okay. Do not wait. Do not delay. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. And thank God you're here, Bill. Definitely thank God you're here. Yep. That yep. last encounter, though, was Rutland Encounter, uh, Volume yep. 1, Bigfoot, Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters. Uh, fascinating account. I know the last one is called Harry Man. And before we came on air, you were talking about pictures or something or evidence that you had seen. Tell us about this. Now, this is going to be in Volume 5, which isn't out yet. Uh, right. which I'm going to buy in October as soon as it comes or in the next couple of weeks as soon as it comes out I'm buying it uh but it's Harry Man volume 5 tell us about it bill yeah now this is actually the hairy men and uh I had seen the picture uh that you're about to hear about and I might as well tell you even though I'm going to read it uh the picture showed a group of men quite a few men actually and a string of what I would call large army tents set up along a wood line that was fairly well cleared out. This was an encampment, and you're going to hear about it. And these tents were probably hmm, maybe 14 feet by 12 feet rectangular, straight sides going down with a flap on the opening, no zipper, and a peaked roof uh, that went up and was no doubt supported by some type of pole structure, you know, within the tent. Uh, I saw this picture, and uh, so let me get right into it with you. It's, it's pretty interesting. Now, the reason I chose this for today, accounts like this, and I have a number of them that are older, uh, two of them that are way older than this one, they bring to the table the continuity of Sasquatch encounters having occurred many, many years before we first had our eyes open to it. Uh, I know for me it was the Patterson-Gimlin film. Uh, I, I think I must have saw that maybe in the latter 60s, early 70s. And when I saw it, I was a believer even then. I said, holy cow, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I had no doubt in my mind that this this was way before computer CG and all this other nonsense that people use to shoot it down today. Uh, you had still photographs, negatives. Uh, to me, it obviously wasn't a man in a, a, a monkey suit. Again, I brought this to the table today to kind of reinforce these creatures being around way before we became aware of it. So here we go. This account was told to me by a fellow named Brian Hoffa, who was actually a resident of Queens, uh, Queens County here in New York, which is pretty close uh, uh, to New York City proper. Uh, here's what Brian had to say. The story of which I'm about to speak was actually handed down to me from my father, having been told to him by my grandfather many years before. My grandfather had passed in 1971, and his wife, my grandmother, had died several years earlier in 1968. At the time of his passing, I was six years old. To be truthful, I didn't know him very well, he being a very quiet man, but I loved him just the same. During the process of cleaning out Grandpa's house, many things were taken including an old photograph which was framed and had been hanging on their home's wall. I had seen this photo many times before, but only now was I to learn the history behind it. Many weeks later, this picture was now hanging in our living room, 
And I asked my dad if Grandpa was one of the men in the picture. He told me, no. Grandpa was the guy who took the picture of the other men and the camp. I suppose a brief history lesson is in order as I begin to relay this story to you and your readers about how it is that my grandpa and these men came to be where they were when the picture was taken. If I am a little off, please forgive me, for I am by no means a historian. In 1916, what we now know as the National Park Service was formed under President Woodrow Wilson. At its inception, it was formed to protect and preserve vast areas of wilderness and the like for the good of the nation and its peoples. There were many great men involved in both overseeing and contributing to this system through the years. John Muir, Theodore Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, and Stephen T. Mather, to name a few. In 1903, during a coast-to-coast trip, Roosevelt came to visit Muir, who was camping in Yosemite, and after having spent the night and awakening to five inches of freshly fallen snow, a spark seemed to have ignited within Roosevelt's heart. In 1906, the Antiquities Act was passed through Congress, which gave sitting presidents the power to create national monuments from then public lands. Roosevelt acted quickly with his newfound power, and the first monument to be created was Devil's Tower in Wyoming, with many others soon to follow. It was during the 30s and the 40s, amidst the Great Depression, and following the war, that the public was clamoring to get into the parks, but how to get to them and what to do when you got there was the dilemma. Now it was in the hands of President Franklin D. Roosevelt to devise a plan, and the so-called Civilian Conservation Corps was formed. In 1935, the Corps had 118 camps located around the country, and it was employing tens of thousands of men with work building roads, bridges, and needed infrastructure for the parks to be seen and enjoyed. My grandfather was part of the core, and this picture was a snapshot of one such camp. Now, the photo shows a group of seven large military-style tents, of which I am sure there were many more, with what appeared to be portable folding wooden tables set up and some men splitting firewood in the foreground. My dad said that the men were heavily armed, according to his father because there were many wild animals to contend with, including grizzly bears, which were regularly coming into the camps. Grandpa had also told him that the men regularly shot and butchered animals for food, and they also fished when near the water. Grandpa had told him of many encounters which the crew had had during the course of their construction with what he described as being giant, hairy men. He told my dad that on many days and nights, the hairy men had entered their camp stealing food and in some cases doing considerable damage, their calling card being enormous footprints left behind in the camp, which were particularly visible after it had rained. I should also mention that the camp... This camp was in the Shenandoah Valley near Luray, Virginia, and the picture was taken in 1935. According to Grandpa, early in the morning in August of 1936, the camp had erupted with screams, shouts, and gunfire. After the melee had subsided, it became known to all that one of the men, while sleeping in a tent with seven others, had been grabbed by his ankle and pulled from his cot by one of the hairy men. Upon the man shouting, the others awoke, throwing hand axes at the beast. 
Grabbing their rifles and shotguns, they gave chase across the grounds. He said that many shots were fired, but the beast was not killed. From that day forward, sentries were set in place throughout the camp, both day and night, to fend off the invading hairy men. He had told my father that the monsters, as he called them, were of enormous stature and strength. The men, during the course of their work, had both seen and heard them felling trees with their bare hands and dragging them through the timber. I mean, I, mean, I don't know what you say about that, you know? Yeah, it doesn't shock me at all. I don't know if you know of uh, Theodore Roosevelt. He wrote about this in his book, not this particular encounter, uh, but he was. It, re, it was another story that was recounted to him from um, an outdoorsman that told him about a killing. Uh, his friend had been killed, and if you read the encounter, it sounds like Sasquatch killed this guy. I mean, I don't know how else you could put it. It's not a bear that killed this guy. Um, and one of the things I think is fascinating, and I didn't know realize this guy was a real man, Gifford Pencho. Uh, the Gifford yeah. Pencho Forest National Forest here in Washington State is notorious for Sasquatch sightings. In fact, oh, that it's, is crazy. It's probably I didn't, I didn't even know where this, there was a Gifford uh, Pencho Forest. Yeah, the Gifford Pencho here in Washington State is notorious for sightings. I mean, their their sightings. I mean, in Washington State, if you hear of an encounter, it probably happened in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. And I find it fascinating that he was one of the guys. As soon as you said that, I knew exactly what you mean because it's 20 minutes from me. Um, wow. And it's a huge, huge forest. I mean, size of freaking New York. It's a huge, huge forest. And it's notorious. It goes all the way up to uh, Mount St. Helens. You know, wow. I'm sure you've heard of Mount St. Helens. It, it of goes course, all, of course. Yeah, it goes all the way up there, and it's notorious for sightings. Absolutely notorious for sightings. And I've often wondered if Theodore Roosevelt did this whole save our national forest, let's make national forest that way. That it's it's for the future generation. I've often wondered if he if he did that based on these creatures to kind of save their environment. It's just a passing thought I've had, but I've often wondered. I don't think he was trying to save a national forest. I think he was trying to save their environment. Now, I, Wes, it is blowing my mind that you just said that because I was thinking maybe months ago about an event that happened, I believe it was in the 70s. Uh, it was on the news stations and they were talking about saving the owls somewhere up and around where you live. And they were talking about it being some little owl that the loggers were infringing on their space and they were going to make them extinct and this and that. And at the time, I didn't think anything of it than uh, a bunch of tree huggers that didn't want people cutting down trees for paper anymore, which I was fine with. But more recently, I said to myself, I wonder, I wonder if there was something else in that woods that they didn't want to bother other than what they were saying was little owls. And you were just hitting on the very same thought that I was having about what his reason was for protecting that area. Yeah, you're talking about the spotted owl. And I'll tell you something about funny about the spotted owl here in the Pacific Northwest, which is what you're referring to as far as them trying to save it. There was another owl, um, I guess, was predatory towards the spotted owl. And so they went through and started killing those owls. And it, the whole spotted owl story just doesn't make any sense. When you go and really look at it, it makes absolutely no sense. It wow. almost feels like a cover story. I'm not a conspiracy, a conspiracy theorist, but when you really examine the spotted owl story, nothing adds up. I mean, absolutely nothing adds up. Yeah, yeah. And to me, with the amount of wilderness in the country regionally up there, there was no way that any logging company was going to tear through the whole area and make it a wasteland 
where this spotted owl didn't have a limb to sit on. So it just didn't ring true to me. It it, it just seemed like uh, more political uh, baloney was being thrown at us. And I never really bought into it. But it was only many, many, many years later that I, in my own mind, was now making a connection that could it have been because of they knew there was Bigfoot in there and they didn't want to have them move out of there into some other more rural areas? I, I, I mean, I don't know. Now, let me ask you something. This uh, Pincho Forest, do you know if that was the area where Roosevelt uh, had been informed by this other gentleman that his partner had been killed? I'd have to go look. I want to say that actually took place in uh, California, but I'd have wow. to look it up. I don't. I don't have the story right in front of me. I want to yeah. say it was in California somewhere. Um, okay. And he told. And Roosevelt wrote it. He wrote the whole story in his book. And when you read it, it doesn't sound like a bear. Doesn't sound like a man. It sounds like a Sasquatch. You know. It's and it, it's fascinating. But I don't think that happened in the Gifford Pencho. Okay. Now Roosevelt. Obviously, he was no man's fool, and he certainly would not have penned a story like that had he not been fully convinced of the both who the individual was that was telling it and the story itself. Absolutely, I uh, agree. That it was yeah. true. I agree 100%. Yeah, there's, there's no way. There's no way. I mean, you know. Uh, that's well, fascinating. Anyway, I, you know, I learned something today. I, I never knew where Gifford Pencho came from. I, I always thought it was kind of a stupid name. Um, and then now that it's named after a guy, now I know where it comes from. And it's fascinating. He knew Theodore Roosevelt. I'm telling you right now, Bill, look up the Gifford Pencho National Forest and Bigfoot. Just Google it. Notorious for sightings. Absolutely wow. notorious for sightings. So where That's I had incredible. my encounter, and many people have been, had encounters in the Gifford Pencho. You know, uh, this study and investigation of Bigfoot phenomena, every time you turn a page, another page is before you. And then another one, and then another one. And it just goes on and on and on. And for the life of me, I cannot believe why these things are not being uh, brought out to the public. It's got to be some nonsense where they think people will be so freaked out by it. They, they won't do this. They won't do that. But I, I I just don't understand it. You know, it's just very bizarre. It is bizarre. And I think it comes down to what it is and where it comes from. And that's why they covered it up. It's not so much, you know, everyone always says, oh, my God, if they said that Bigfoot was real, everyone would grab their rifles and they'd head out to the woods. I don't believe that. I've, yeah. I've been a hunter most of my life. I've known many hunters. You don't just go out and blast something just to blast something. And even if you had that mentality, good luck. Good luck to you. you. We probably won't see you again. You'll probably be in the missing 411. Take care of yourself yeah, um, yeah. because you probably aren't going to make it too far out there blasting one of these things unless yeah, you really I, know what you're doing. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even risk it. Uh, I can only imagine if somebody ever uh, scores one and brings it in, which some claim they have, and the bodies were then disappeared uh, mysteriously. Uh, so I don't know what's going on with all of that. Uh, I have a very interesting, uh, story. I don't know if you read it yet called the cargo that I haven't was known. Incredible. Uh, well, that was incredible and, uh, give it a read. Uh, what, what volume is that bill? What, and what uh, book is I that? I believe the cargo is in, Oh, sorry, my friend. Cargo is also in volume five. Oh, I was going to say, I don't remember reading that one. I don't remember yeah, seeing that, that one. That'll, that'll blow your mind. I mean, that, you know, again, for the person who says, oh, it's all BS, okay, good for you. I can't help you any further. Have a nice day. But if you are of the mindset that the individual who brought forth the story is a person of integrity, uh, in this case, it was another uh, law enforcement guy, 
do you think it, he's full of Buki too? I mean, where does it end? Is everybody uh, a lion sack of you know what? <laughs> and nobody is capable of uh, giving hard evidence or putting anything critical out on there to say, I saw this, this is what I saw, take it or leave it, you know. It just, it, it, I, I don't understand that. I don't understand it. You know, the rejection, the open-faced rejection of uh, damn near everything that is brought to bear about Bigfoot. You yeah. know what? Uh, my wife is Spanish. She's from South America. Sometimes we watch uh, Spanish TV. And occasionally, when we're watching Spanish television uh, and the news broadcasts come on, do you know that they, I wouldn't say regularly, of course I'm not watching this every day like the daily news, but I have seen repeated broadcasts where oddities were put right up on the TV and the reporters were reading the notes from their desk. And whether it's about a UFO over Mexico City, a UFO in the Yucatan Peninsula, a chupacabra sighting, uh, a ghost seen walking across uh, a cemetery. I mean, they will post everything and anything and just put it out there for you to see. And I don't see any of that around me. Nothing. So, uh, you know, what is with that? Why is there no fear there on letting you have a look? And all of the fear seems to be here in the United States. Uh, I, I just can't figure it out. It's, it just seems almost like uh, more political baloney to me, where you never really get the truth, you know? Yeah, it is. It is. It, it's funny. I was watching a thing on YouTube, and uh, actually, I think it was on Facebook, and it was the same script. And they show like 50 news stations around the United States, and they're all reading the same script. So I think it comes down to it's like I said, if you kill one, you drag it to a news station, it'll never see the light of day because who's paying the bills? And I can tell you who's paying the bills, and that'll never see the light of day. That's why you don't see that stuff here in the United States. There's like two corporations that own all of the news stations. That's why they're all reading the same script. I'm sure most of the listeners know what I'm talking about if you've seen it on Facebook, where they start off with one news station. I think it's like in New York. Then they cut it to like here in the Pacific Northwest. Then they cut to California, then they cut to Texas, then they cut to Louisiana, Florida. They're all reading the same script. It's the exact same news you're getting. <laughs> and if that, is a, if that isn't worrisome, I don't know what to tell you because that's worrisome to me. If that's where your information is coming from, I might want to start looking at other areas. Yeah, well, that's it. You know, in other words, the same people own the networks that own the papers, that own the magazines – and basically, the people sitting before us are talking heads in suits and ties that are paid to read what's put before them on the teleprompter or the desk. There's no, when I was a kid, we had Walter Cronkite. Everybody looked at this guy on CBS like he was their grandfather. Uh, when Kennedy got shot, he was crying on the television. You really felt like you were getting the straight story at that point in time. And I don't even know if then we really were, but I was too young to think otherwise. It just seemed like there was more integrity uh, and honesty uh, in the media the further you went back. I agree with you. Uh, you know, and what else can I say? You know, it's just, uh, but on and on we must go, and we will go, uh, presenting the things that come before us and uh, it's in, in the interest of keeping those like your listenership and people like myself and you uh, abreast of what's being seen and, and, and evidence that's being f brought forth, whether other people choose to believe it or not. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Bill. I really couldn't agree more. And um, I know Bill and I are going to talk at the end of the week. I'll have him tell his angel story. I'll throw it up on Sasquatch Chronicles. I know some of the listeners wanted to hear it. And I'll tell mine to Bill. I'll throw, I'm not going to keep Bill. I'll hold it. I'll throw it up later well, on in the week. Um, Rush, do you want me to share the story? Yeah, if you got time, Bill. I know you. I know you. Sure. 
No, it's it's no problem at all. It'll take me five minutes, ten minutes, and it's uh, you know it's interesting again in the light if you believe it, and if you don't believe me, <laughs> it really doesn't matter to me because once again I know what happened to you, uh, and uh, well I don't know what happened to you, but you know what happened to you, and I know what happened to me. And by the way. Uh, I've had numerous encounters with angels. In this particular one, after you hear it, I believe my life was saved, and you can make your own judgment. Uh, at that time in my life, I was a construction worker, and uh, the firm that I worked for uh, was involved predominantly in industrial renovations. Uh, we were uh, doing a lot of block, brick, pouring foundations for large machines, uh, fencing, roofing, interior design changes. And on this particular day, I believe we were uh, in a town called Plainview here on Long Island. And I had been busting my hump in the hot sun for the entire day. And I was on my way back to Eastern Long Island on what we call 495, which is a, uh, a big interstate over here. It runs from basically uh, uh, close to uh, New York City uh, out to a town called Riverhead on Long Island. And then you go to little tributary roads from there, like all the way out to Montauk Point. So I was on my way home on 495. At the time, I think I had, it was either a 1969 or a 70 Toyota Corolla, which was a little tin junk box. Uh, when I was sitting in there, and I was a big, burly character, when I was sitting in there, I was hanging over into the passenger seat, and my left shoulder was right up against the door, uh, which was basically two pieces of sheet metal with a slot for the window to go up and down in. <laughs> I mean, yeah. there was nothing <laughs> to this thing. And I'm heading home on the LIE. We call it the Long Island Expressway, the LIE 495. And bumper to bumper traffic. And I was coming up to a road known as Comac Road, where I knew there was a delicatessen uh, that I could stop in and get something cold to drink. So I got off uh, 495, went under the overpass, pulled into the parking lot of this delicatessen. And by the time I went inside and came out with my beverage, two tractor trailer trucks had parked along the curb on Colmack Road, flanking either side of the exit. In other words, now you couldn't drive out of the driveway seeing what was coming southbound or northbound. These tr tractors with, you know, 45 foot trailers on them were on either side. And I'm sitting there like, boy, this just ices the cake here, man. After the day I had, now I, 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 I can't even pull out of the driveway here until one of these trucks leaves or both of them leave. So I decided I wasn't going to wait. I backed up away from the driveway to a point where I could now see both northbound and southbound on Comac Road. And in my mind, I was just going to wait till I saw the last car coming from each direction that was visible to me go by. And then, in my mind, the road would be clear. Well, here I am in my Toyota, sitting back maybe 50 feet from these tractor trailers, looking north and southbound, and I was convinced that it was good to go. I started moving up, and I was about to put my foot on the gas. I was already putting my foot on the gas. And so help me God Almighty, a hand, I could feel the fingers and hear the noise of the slap. 
whacked my left knee. Now, there is nothing. Uh, you couldn't have fit a football uh, under the steering wheel of this car with me sitting in the seat, the wheel in front of me and the dashboard coming down underneath it. And this hand came through and slapped my knee against the brake pedal. Now, I swear to you, I was in no way, shape, or form stepping on the brake or going to step on the brake. I was accelerating out onto Comac Road when this happened. And as soon as the hand hit my leg, a four-door Cadillac DeVille tore the front end off of my Toyota. Oh, wow. He went through maybe, I shouldn't say, to, I don't want you to think like the whole engine. He ripped off maybe four inches deep from my front end, the bumper, the headlight buckets, the hood, uh, the grill, and kept going. He didn't even stop. And I sat there like, what just happened? And yet I knew what happened, but I was trying to say to myself, my God, that car would have T-boned me right in the door. And the door was like nothing. It would be like sitting in a, a refrigerator box and getting hit by a truck. It, there was no way that that door would have saved me from a broadside from this freaking 5,000-pound Cadillac. And I just sat there and said to myself, oh, my God. And do you know, I never shared that story with anybody for decades. None of my friends knew about it. Nobody knew why my car got smashed up in the front. I never told a soul. But I knew what had happened. And later on in my life, uh, because of that and some other situations, my life was changed forever. Yeah, so that's, that's that's amazing. That, that Cadillac yeah, would have cut through you, cut through that Toyota like a knife through hot butter. I mean, you wouldn't have yeah. stood a chance if that thing would hit you broadside. Yeah, I don't think so either, Wes. I mean, you know, it would have it would have probably punched me out of the passenger door if and, I would and have so survived. You, and so you felt something slap your leg, like to kind of well, stop I, off the gas. So help me God. If you take your hand, open hand, and slap it hard down against your thigh right now, the same feeling that you experience and the same sound that you will hear doing it was exactly what happened to me. I could feel five fingers whack me on the leg, and it drove my foot actually off the floor onto the brake pedal. I can't even explain to you how that could happen. And the car lurched. My head went forward and the Cadillac impacted the front, uh, ripping the, the, the nose off of the car, all in like, it was simultaneously. Wow. And I just sat there like, and do you know, not a soul came over to me. There was... People in the deli, the trucks were there. Nobody was in the parking lot. Nobody apparently heard it. Not a soul came over to me or pulled over and said, oh, my God, are you okay? I saw the car. I got his plate. Nothing. This plate, this uh, Cadillac took, up, uh, took off northbound, and he didn't even speed away. It was like he was doing 45 miles an hour slid along the front of my car and just kept driving forward. This guy must have been high as a kite or drunk himself to not even stop or it seemed like he didn't even realize he hit me. Yeah, that's crazy. <coughs> Gosh. Very, very strange. You're lucky to be alive, Bill. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm convinced I wouldn't be here now uh, had that uh, not occurred in my life. Thank God. You know, like yeah, I that said, that Cadillac would have cut through you like a a knife through hot butter, man. It would have cut through that Toyota like it was nothing. 
And yeah, you, pro- yeah. you obviously wouldn't be here. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. And I think sometimes God steps in and, and helps you out sometimes in life. You know, I'm a firm believer yeah. in that. I'm not really into church. I'm not really into religion. But I think that there's a creator out there that, some you know, steps in sometimes and helps you out. Yep. Well, you know what? I'm going to throw a little plug uh, for book six to keep you and your uh, listeners interested. Along the lines of what you just said, this uh, notion of divine in- intervention, uh, a hunter uh, who I have his account in book six, I named this account the priest. And when book six comes out, Make sure you read that story. <laughs> I will. That's I can't all, wait. That's all I will say. Make sure you read that story. Yeah, it will I can't just wait. knock you out of your socks and across the room. So, you know, these things are happening. Bigfoot sightings are happening. Uh, Unidentified flying object sightings are happening. Angelic encounters are happening. All of these things are happening to people around the world, and there is almost no talk about it anywhere, except in venues such as your own and uh, other stations or podcasts uh, that are handling such things and discussing them. Other than that, there is no discussion being offered about these things whatsoever. And I'm of the mindset where I share many things with many people because I enjoy talking to people and I enjoy hearing from people what they have to say uh, after I open the door with them uh, by saying something myself and bringing them to a point where they now feel safe. You know, that you feel welcome. When you hear somebody speak of Bigfoot, now you say, well, you know, no, I don't know. Please tell me. (laughs) And it's amazing uh, how many things are shared just through the act of sharing. I agree. And and you see it even on the show. I mean, there's people who, you know, they'll say, hey, I heard episode such and such. And the guy was talking about this. And I and let me tell you what happened to me. It's almost identical to what happened to them. And it is. It's like the first guy that raises his hand in class and wants to speak out. All of a sudden, everyone in class wants to speak out. And it takes that one person to come forward. But, you know, if you feel comfortable, you're absolutely right, Bill. People, uh, people come forward and share a lot of things with you. I've heard a lot of strange stories um, just because of a show I did or a person I had on the show uh, they'll want to come forward and share it. You know, I think if you give off like you're, you, it's not a joke to you and it's not fun and games to you, it's serious to you, most people will share with you what they've seen and what they've experienced. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, something worse, if I could throw a little plug in there. I don't know if anybody's listening or if anybody in your audience uh, has the wherewithal. But I've been thinking to myself, and somebody mentioned this to me the other day, that a lot of these stories here, if you broke them down with uh, crews and film or whatnot, you could make one hell of a series out of these encounters. No, I agree. Uh, Hollywood disagrees, though. I've been down, trust me, I've been down that road Uh on many occasions. I've turned down many production companies. Uh, because they want to turn it into some sort of joke. And I'm like, just just go with the material. There's nothing more that's needed. I don't need your scary uh-huh. music. You don't need to have, film someone banging on a tree. Just go with <laughs> what happened to someone. And yes. But, you know, Hollywood has it all figured out, so it's hard to sell it to them as far as reality doesn't seem like something that sells very well. Even though it does, I mean, you listen to podcasts of people sharing their encounters. You read Bill's book, people sharing their – it's fascinating. It's very fascinating. Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately yeah, – there's, there's, no, there's no doubt about it, you know. Uh, I just said to myself from a pure entertainment aspect, you want to be rocked out of your socks. All you have to do is talk to some of these witnesses. I mean, if that doesn't frighten you, uh, I don't know what will, you know. 
Yeah, so especially gonna... since it's a true, you know, when you tell some, you can tell a, a fictional story, but when you tell a story, it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever, I've experienced this recently. I can't give you an example, but uh, actually I can. It was Tom Cruise. He was in a, um, what's the name of the movie? He was a drug runner. I can't remember the name of the movie. And when you watch the movie, you're like, oh my God, this is a great, no one's going to believe this. This is the most ridiculous mm-hmm story I've ever heard. Then you find out it's a real story and you're just like, oh my God, I can't believe that was a real story. And yeah, I kind of yeah. wish I could remember the name of that. It, Tom Cruise, drug ru- he's he's like a drug runner. Um, I'll send it to you, Bill. I can't think of the name of the movie off the top of my head, but mm-hmm. when you watch it and then realize this is a real story or a true story, you're just blown away by it because you're like, no one's going to believe. If Hollywood would have written that story, no one would have believed that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I guess there's a, a, a certain amount of truth to that. You know, if they wash it over, it's not exactly like a documentary. But when you're speaking about something that's said not to exist, what is it but, you know, bogus material? If it's never identified as being legitimate, really everything we say or do about it relative to mainstream is bogus. Yeah, it's, it's unicorns. It's, it's just all jive talking, you know? Yeah. No, well, wow. I appreciate you coming on, Bill. I know you and I are going to talk at the end of the week. For the listening audience out and Bill, thank you for taking the time to come on, too, by the way. Awesome. I really appreciate it. I'm really glad to be here. No, I appreciate your time. Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters, Volume 1 through 4. I'll put a link underneath this episode. Uh, W.J. Sheehan, Bill Sheehan, definitely pick up his book. Excellent read. Bill, thank you again for coming on. I really do appreciate it. Well, thank you, and thank you, listening audience, for uh, spending some time listening to me. Thanks, Bill. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. Until next time, everyone. Some tone